Let's take an approach to looking at um, comparing two types of livestock production systems. One would be based on grain and one based on grass. So sometimes we call this grain fed, sometimes we call these grass fed. Uh, in a grain fed situation, the livestock themselves are usually confined, which is to say that they are in uh, feedlots or in barns. And of course in grass uh, fed situations, they primarily are out on pastures or grasslands. And so if we can consider these two systems side by side, <coughs> think about the um, sort of the environmental effects uh, on these. And rather than uh, beating over the head with a lot of numbers and whatnot, I just want to um, do sort of a qualitative comparison here. And so let's consider that the livestock in a confined situation are either kept in some sort of barn. <laughs> Here's a cow. Not a very well-fed one apparently, but it's in a barn of some kind, and uh, that's compared to uh, an animal that is, <laughs> this is maybe even worse, out on pasture, grazing grass. <laughs> maybe that looks more like a horse, but it's supposed to be a cow. Eating grass, being fed grain, that's the comparison. And so when we look at these two systems, the cows are eating grass here, or they're being fed grain, and that grain is produced by row crops, and let's just say that's primarily corn and soybeans that are fed to the livestock. And then of course the livestock have their excreta or their manure, and often that gets contained in some sort of a lagoon, pond, and uh, the excreta of the uh, cows on pasture just get sent right back to the, to the soil. And then eventually these nutrients from these lagoons and ponds are spread back out onto cropland, although usually the cropland doesn't have crops growing on it at the time, it might have some stubble. All right, so that's sort of the general proposition. And of course, uh, we've talked a little bit in this class about how the animals themselves uh, belch a lot, especially cows, but they belch a lot, and as a result, they emit methane. And in both cases, these animals emit methane. and uh, I would say to a higher, or it's pretty clear that the more grass and forage the animal consumes as a proportion of their diet, the more that comes off as methane. So we'll make that arrow a little bit fatter here. Um, what we've talked about too is that soils, especially when they're fertilized, emit a lot of nitrous oxide. And so let's assume that these corn and soybeans are fertilized, especially the corn phase. And so we're going to get a lot of N2O emissions to the atmosphere, which is a greenhouse gas uh, as a result of nitrogen fertilizer that comes in, generally in the form of ammonium but there are various forms that it comes in. Let's just leave it at that for now. But of course that ammonium is produced in a factory somewhere using the Haber-Bosch process of industrial nitrogen fixation. This process of making the nitrogen, of taking dinitrogen from the atmosphere and breaking the bonds in the dinitrogen to produce this ammonium, uh, that itself requires energy, and so as a result, there's CO2 emitted as a result of fossil fuel combustion. In order to put the energy, basically to take the energy from these molecules and put it into these molecules, we have to use that energy, and that goes off to the atmosphere. <clears throat> there are uh, transportation costs to consider here. I'll draw some sort of truck here, tank, that's hauling stuff, and of course that's emitting CO2. Uh, there are other transportation costs associated with tractors and heavy equipment for spreading fertilizer, and so let's add some more of that coming from tractors, uh, from the farm fields themselves. And then one of the things we talked about in class is that the soils from these farm fields are actually losing carbon that's been stored off to the atmosphere as CO2. Uh, these lagoon ponds are sources of methane that's coming off of the lagoon and also sources of into o and then when we spread those um, spread that manure back out onto the field we've got into o coming off those fields methane coming off those fields so far really all I've done is depict, depict the gaseous emissions from um, the various steps of the process here in this grain fed confined situation but we also can have uh, significant amounts of nitrate leaching that gets into waterways to groundwater
and eventually surface waters. As well, we get overland flow and loss of phosphorus. That groundwater eventually will find surface waters. Part of that is soil particles themselves leaving, carrying with it phosphorus. That gets into the waterways. And then these lagoon ponds themselves can be sources of nitrate contamination and also fecal coliforms that can get into groundwater and drinking water supplies. So we've got a myriad of um, gaseous loss pathways and aqueous phase loss pathways here of carbon, nitrogen, and phosphorus. And we've talked a lot in class about how the gaseous um, uh, emissions of the atmosphere help drive uh, climate change. And these aqueous phase emissions uh, help drive eutrophication of downstream aquatic ecosystems primarily. So let's just for comparison look at this grass pasture where um, the livestock are out feeding themselves essentially on grass that was uh, growing year after year after year as perennial grassland. And as we've talked about, there are significant methane emissions. And there are some N2O emissions from these pastures, but they are um, significantly lower than they are from uh, fields where um, a lot of nitrogen is being added for fertilizer. We tend not to get extensive amounts of fertilizer addition to pastures. It can be a problem, and so uh, that's one of the things we have to work on when we talk about grazed grasslands is uh, finding ways to reduce the amount of nitrogen that comes into these systems. And so, you know, occasionally farmers will add uh, nitrogen fertilizer, but typically not a lot. Most of the fertilizer, or the, excuse me, most of the nitrogen that gets fixed and comes into the system uh, comes in via biological fixation through legumes, clovers, alfalfa, other legumes that um, are often found in a mixture in a pasture. Um, and so the, the less we bring in an exogenous forms of industrially produced ammonium, nitrogen, uh, the, the less likely we are to get significant N2O emissions from grass-based pastures. But that's not to say that there aren't any, there are some. <clears throat> and then we've talked quite a bit about the carbon balance of these systems. And we mentioned that over here in the grain-fed system, uh, it's pretty clear from lots and lots of long-term data that these are carbon sources of CO2 to the atmosphere. Um, one of the interesting things about pasture is that, uh, remember at the Wix plots, at least the surface horizons were carbon sinks. So we had CO2 coming out of the atmosphere and going into the soil. Um, and what was also clear is that from these depths, we were losing carbon. So the, the deeper soil depths uh, were actually losing CO2. And so one of the things we're very keen to do is work on ways to reverse this trend and find ways to make CO2 accumulate. And a lot of that uh, we think is related to the rooting depth of grasses. And so we uh, would like to get grasses, grass plants, that have deeper, more extensive rooting systems in an effort to try and reverse this trend and get more CO2 accumulating uh, in deeper soil horizons. All that said, you'll recall that from the Wix uh, experiment, basically these two arrows canceled each other out so that we had a, a net zero uh, soil carbon balance over a 20 year period at Wix. So <clears throat> really there aren't um, significant emissions there with respect to soil loss of carbon uh, to the pastures. And so um, clearly the way we bound the system is important because these animals are eventually harvested. And so there are uh, transportation. <laughs> this is a pickup truck that's carrying livestock. There are CO2 emissions from transportation, but of course those are, are had by uh, the grain confined systems as well. There is also the potential for, um, for nitrate leaching from pastures. Although the more extensive this root production system is, the less likely that is to happen. And in fact, we know that there's um, a lot less nitrate being lost beneath pastures than there is uh, beneath uh, annual cropping systems, mainly because of the soil disturbance, but also because of the uh, shallower roots in annual crops compared to perennial crops. And then finally, uh, with respect to uh, overland flow of uh, soils and phosphorus loss pathways, phosphorus and soil, because the grass plants themselves above ground are quite dense and uh, impede the movement of soil, uh, that in, impedes the movement of part of uh, phosphorus that would be glommed onto the soil. And so we get a significantly less amount, uh, if any, soil loss from grazed pastures, from grasslands that are grazed. And one thing I want to say that I really want to make clear, this is not just a panacea where just having grass pasture is enough. It has to be well managed. And by well managed, we mean maintaining a dense sward of grasses that do this impeding of um, soil loss. Uh, that allow for extensive roots to be produced and to grow. 
that allow for biological nitrogen fixation rather than um, industrial fixation, and that allow for plant vigorous plant growth to take up nitrogen before it's leached and lost uh, to the system to the um, to groundwater and surface waters. So it's not just enough to just say, well, we have grass there. Uh, we have to we have to manage it well, and there's lots lots to learn about how how we manage it well. And so this is really just meant to be like a qualitative look at. Um, the fluxes in a system, and you can see here that, uh, or hopefully what you can see here is that the grass-based pasture system is just a lot tighter system of nutrient and carbon cycling. Uh, the rub is, of course, that it's uh, a bit less productive overall. And so, as I mentioned in the past, if we're going to have these types of systems dominate our landscapes, then we have to, as a society, find a way to help farmers to incentivize farmers to make this sort of a system work, uh, as opposed to one like this where we basically crack open all the nutrient cycles and uh, squeeze the system for everything we can.